Happy Father's Day to all of you dads, granddads, and spiritual fathers who are investing in that next generation. Uh, A little challenge for us dads. Did you know that Mother's Day is now the third highest attended weekend of the year when it comes to gathering to worship the Lord? Um, Father's Day? Not quite on par with the ladies. <laughs> you know, when we think Father's Day, we think dad and outside, maybe a grill or a swimming pool. But hey, men, we know that sitting in a chair for 75 minutes doesn't constitute a life that is fully devoted to the Lord. We know what it means to be warriors. We know what it means to have an adversary. We know what it looks like to be willing to make a sacrifice in following God. And I am so encouraged by by you, by the men of God here in our church I see you following the Lord in a really special way. I actually was compelled to make a list. Uh, I am so proud of Cornerstone Men, how that ministry is challenging our men to be men of God. I'm really, really proud of Charlie, Richard, and Michael. They started a Verge group, but they have turned into an incubator, helping men connect and be honest with each other on their journey of following Jesus. I'm proud of a dad who pretty discreetly said to me, hey, uh, I've taken custody, full custody, and I've had to adjust my life to be able to have my son in my home. John and Dave started a podcast to challenge men to passionately pursue the Lord. And multiple men have given their life to Jesus because of that new podcast. JD has shared his faith in tragedy, and his job is not one you would think of as a person sharing faith in Jesus. But he has. Nick shared with me the last 10 years how he and Brenda have had to navigate the details of their family to be able to align with the purposes of Jesus. And John shared how he and Cherish are struggling with the challenge of being involved in three different communities, work, home, and church, and figuring out how do they align and serve the community where God has placed them. I am so proud of you men of God who are rising up and we're in for a treat. I've been fired up all weekend because we have the opportunity to look at the story of David and be inspired by the man after God's heart. And we get to take an inside look to see how the spirit of God transformed him into a mighty man of God. So here we go. Grab your Bible or one out of the pocket in front of you. If you do that, you can go ahead and turn to page 185. We're headed to 1 Samuel 16. This This is David. You undoubtedly know him as the Goliath killer. You probably know him as king of Israel you might know him as the one who had the 30 mighty men and the three mighty men right around him. But what you probably don't know, as was captured in our scripture reading, is that David began in obscurity. David was totally forgotten God sent the prophet Samuel with this message. I have a new king. Go anoint him. He's in the family of Jesse. Get them together. And so when Jesse got his family together for this special anointing, though Jesse didn't know exactly what was going to happen, David wasn't even invited. They had to go through the whole list. And the Lord had to say, nope, 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 to where Samuel said to Jesse, any more sons? And Jesse said to him, well, we've got the punk kid, little David, but he's, he's taking care of the sheep, so we, the important people, could be here at the party. 
Men, there are some of you who have had that scar in your life. Your dad, your family counted you out. You, you weren't the right gender. You weren't manly enough. You weren't successful enough. You experienced the scar of being overlooked. And for some of us, maybe it wasn't your dad or your family. It's, it's this position you find yourself in now. Uh, the other kids, the other coworkers, you feel overlooked. David started life with that baggage, but it did not hold him back. How did he get victory over being overlooked? So that's our journey. Jump into the story with me, chapter 16, verse 12. Now, it seems like a compliment. David was Rudy, had beautiful eyes, and was handsome. There, there are many of us who would say, um, I wish you would describe me like that. However, this is a jab. I, I loved it as we studied together. Our sermon study team recognized these are the same words Goliath used to describe him when David came out on the battlefield. Basically, it's this. You sent this cutie pie out to fight me? I will destroy him. That was the problem. David was seen as cute and cuddly. He was not seen as a man of God, somebody everybody would want to follow and be anointed by God to do anything significant. He was overlooked. But... The Lord had a word for Samuel. The reality is Samuel bought into the lie, the cultural expectations. Samuel got sucked into what a man should look like, what a new king should look like. But the Lord said to Samuel, verse seven, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Boy, do we know that to be true today. People size you up so quickly by your appearance, by your dress, by your position, by the car you drive, by what is perceived to be success or not. People size you up constantly by the way you look. But that's not how God sees you. For those of us who today, male or female, father or not, the message the Lord wants for all of us to hear today is this one. The Lord sees you. He sees you. For all of you who were overlooked by your dad, a boss, a group of people, family, friends, the community, whoever it's been. If you have felt overlooked, hear that message from the Lord today. He sees you. And the Lord saw David that day. He sure wasn't expected to be the one. But God said to Samuel, anoint him to be the next king. And the scripture says that the spirit of God rushed upon him beginning on that day. His life was transformed and being transformed, which really poses a fun question. What did the spirit of God use to transform this cute little kid into a warrior, into the king of Israel? I mentioned these last week, but we're gonna see them show up in the life of David. Here's what the Spirit of God used in young David's life to transform him into a mighty warrior of God. Number one, the story of God. Now, what do I mean by the story of God? Truth as defined by God. What was the truth being spoken over young David? You're cute. Take care of the sheep, would you please? What was the truth of God? I see you, mighty warrior. 
David believed God. And from that day on, he began to live out the story of God. He began to live the truth that God had spoken over him through the prophet Samuel. And we see it show up. You, you most know David for slaying Goliath. So let's jump to that scene. Move on over to chapter 17. Daddy <laughs> has now sent David on a mission. This is years later. He's still tending to the sheep. Daddy sends him on a mission. We would call it DoorDash. Dad says, I want you to take bread and cheese to the battlefront. And as David arrives on that day, it was the same as all the other 40 days. This dude named Goliath stepped onto the battlefield. And what he was doing was taunting the army of God. He was saying, hey, let's boil it down to one-on-one. -on -one. Representative warfare. You send your best, and I'll take him out. 40 days in a row. Now, many of you know that story. Here's what you probably didn't think about. Goliath was speaking his truth, and the army of God was believing him. Jump into the story with me. So here it is, verse 10 of chapter 17. The Philistine said, here he is speaking his truth, as we would say today. I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. One-on-one, -on -one, let's settle this. Your best against me. When Saul and all Israel heard the words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Goliath spoke his truth, and they believed it. And believing Goliath was correct, they were afraid. And everybody went and hid every time Goliath stepped out. What was the truth? This is the army of God. What, what was the truth? These are the people of Israel, same group. Parting of the Red Sea, crossing on dry ground, Ten Commandments, anointing of God, promised land. These are the Israelites. But they did not feel like mighty warriors of God. They did not feel anointed by the power of the Spirit. They believed Goliath when he spoke his truth over them. But not David. He showed up with his DoorDash bread and cheese and says, who is this? Jump with me to verse 26. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Now, that, that'll catch you weird. Like, why is David talking about a warrior being circumcised or not? That's odd. For the people of God, Circumcision was the indication of identity. It was the way in which they obediently and boldly declared, we are the people of God, marked by our faith in him. What is the truth? They were chosen by him. <laughs> what is the truth? They had the power of God. And yet, all they could see was this powerful warrior. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? David saw a completely different story unfolding. And his question was, who's gonna take him out? Need a volunteer? I will. What did he believe? He believed he was the anointed man of God. It was not his height versus Goliath's height. It was Goliath versus God. It was not his strength versus Goliath's strength. It was Goliath versus God. It all begins with a foundation of truth. Rise up, O men of God. 
you must stand in his presence and power or this whole thing falls apart. What is the truth of God? First of all, he defines truth. We live in a world where we're told, you speak your truth, you figure it out for you, oh man of God. You must first start with the absolute truth of God. Part of that is that we are all sinners in need of a savior. Just like David, his faith was in his God. You are invited to place your faith in the finished work of Jesus and get out from under trying to become that man that your dad can be proud of, trying to become that man that society will say is successful and instead find your identity, power, and success in the finished work of Jesus. Oh, man of God, it must first start with truth. And when David came onto the battlefield, he saw Goliath in a whole new way. Nobody else could see Goliath versus God. All they could see was Goliath versus me. Rise up, oh, man of God. It's not about your strength. It is about the power of God through you. So word gets back to the king, King Saul. And the word is, hey, this kid named David is asking who's gonna take Goliath out. Wanna see him? And Saul's like, yep, 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 bring him in. And at first Saul's like, ah, uh, no way can you do this. But after David declares his faith, Saul says, okay, you can go. And so David steps onto the battle scene, and here's what we find out. Jump down to verse 49. David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone, slung it, and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face to the ground. This is the legendary story of David versus Goliath. This has become part of our culture. The little guy takes on the big guy. Use your smallness to be more nimble and overcome the behemoth. Think whatever business it is that rules the world, you as the little guy can overtake the big one. And if we're not careful, this story of David and Goliath becomes a myth or a model story of overcoming the behemoth. And we're tempted to begin to think, it's not real, does it even matter if it's real? I just like the story. Little guy always wins, I always root for the underdog. Oh my friend, it is absolutely essential that you believe this to be fact, not legend. And there's good reason to believe what is posited here as truth. You might say, whoa, 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 whoa. So you mean to tell me this kid, yes, he's still a teenager, takes a sling and a rock and knocks the mighty Goliath dead. Well, slow down, slow down. Number one, he's not dead yet. Number two, this sling that um, maybe you have one of those little fing, fing in mind, nope. These guys could put a rock, think baseball-ish size, in a sling and swing it. If you go back to the book of Judges, there were 700 left-handed men who could hit at a hair's width accuracy a target with one of those stones. These guys were trained professionals. That's what David's doing. He is a trained professional with a sling. If men today can throw a baseball at 100 miles per hour, you increase the arc by the length of his sling, easily could he hurl a baseball-sized stone at over 100 miles per hour. That'll knock a guy out. It does not say Goliath is dead. 
It says the stone sunk into his head and he fell flat on his face. Knocked him out cold. Now, if you were here on Mother's Day, ladies, I gave you a gift. We had this lady named JL who drove a stake through this dude's head, and I was careful not to get too graphic. It's Father's Day, all gloves off. <laughs> okay, so Goliath is flat on his face, knocked out by a stone. Here's the rest of the story. Verse 49, there was no sword in the hand of David. That's all he had, sling and stones. Goliath is now face down. Then David ran, stood over the Philistine, and took his sword. So he grabs Goliath's sword, drew it out of its sheath, and killed him. What was the cause of death? Decapitation. Now, ladies, I know with Jaya, we were sweet. David went and hacked his head off. So, so ladies, if, if, um, if, if you have not yet bought the father in your life, a Father's Day gift, I found one for you. You can buy online a mug that shows David holding Goliath by his head. <laughs> they even have a supersize. So uh, I, it's, it's too late to get it shipped in today on time, but you could just show him the picture, the receipt, and say, Happy Father's Day, O man of God. <laughs> Be brutal. Anyway, anyway, okay, so there we are, there we are. Okay, so back to the story. David takes his head off. Israel then suddenly has confidence and they defeat the Philistines. And David's life got worse. All of a sudden, everybody's talking about David. Yeah, Saul, you're, you're pretty good, but David's awesome. And Saul could see it coming. He knew God had removed his anointing and that there was a new king coming. And pretty quickly, he connected the dots. For the remainder of his teenage years and all through his 20s, David was a hunted man by the reigning king of Israel, Saul. Why? because he'd been obedient to God. You see, there are some of you, O oh men of God, who are in the between. God has made a promise, you've read it in scripture. Maybe it was prophesied over you as well. You've been told who God declares you to be. Maybe you're sure not there yet. Maybe you're being attacked, maybe overlooked. And you've thought, God told me? But it's not become true. For David, all of his 20s, the rest of his teenage years, his life was difficult. But he still believed the story of God. He continued to base his life in that truth, even though it wasn't paying off very well yet. And as he took this journey as a mighty man of God, we see the second thing that the Spirit of God used to raise him up into an incredible warrior with influence. So if you still have your Bible open, jump over to chapter 22. So David's on the run for his life. I can't exaggerate. David is running for his life from King Saul. Why? Because the king is jealous of what God is doing through David. And look what happens. 22 verse two. Everyone who was in distress and everyone who was in debt and everyone who was bitter in soul. As I read that this weekend again, the word everyone jumped off the page. David attracted uh, a bunch of scallywags, you know, a, a bunch of people who were in a mess. And at first you might say, well, that's not very encouraging, except, zoom ahead in scripture, that sure sounds a lot like the people Jesus attracted. Hmm. 
They gathered to him, and he became commander over them. David could not have done what David did if it were not for, number two, his circle of friends. Now, this group gets around him, and what he first does is declare truth to them. Like These, these are a bunch of messed up people, struggling people. Some of them just looking for a way to be against Saul. But David discipled them, mentored them. He taught them truth. O oh, men of God, you cannot accomplish what the Lord has for you by yourself. And the starting point is to look for men around you who can stand with you and as part of that journey with them, teach them truth. You don't know all the truth yet, but you know some of the truth of God. Share that with them and take the journey. David didn't know how this thing was going to work out, but he continued to declare the truth of God. Along the way, God handed King Saul into David's hands two times, like on a silver platter, where he could have killed the king. And his buddies are saying, hey, look at this. It must be a gift from God for you to destroy him. And it would have been very logical for David to have justified executing the king. I mean, isn't this self-defense? And yet David knew the truth. Look, look what he says to them. This is over in chapter 26. Verse 10. And they've said to him, hey, kill him, kill him, kill him. Right here he is. And David says, as the Lord lives, the Lord will strike him down or his day will come to die, like natural causes, or he will go down in battle and perish. Somebody else will kill him. The Lord forbid that I should put out my hand against the Lord's anointed. What did David know? God does not need me to do his work. In this case, this is the Lord's anointed king, and when God is done with him, it will be over. I don't need to take matters into my own hands. The Lord has not called me to execute the reigning king. Even though he's in the in-between, even though he's hunted by that king, David says, no. He mentored, discipled, and raised these men up to be mighty men of God. Let me show you one verse. Don't turn to this one. Here's a quick summary from 1 Chronicles. These are the chiefs of David's mighty men who gave him strong support in his kingdom together with all Israel to make him king according to the word of the Lord concerning Israel. In quick summary, David could not have done what God called David to do without his circle of friends. O oh, men of God, your life must be based in truth, the story of God. And secondly, you need a circle of friends. Who have you surrounded yourself with? By the time it was over, David was surrounded by these mighty men of God. It would not have been possible for him to become king, for him to reign as he did without his circle of friends. Men, there are some of you trying to do this by yourself. Oh, man of God. Stand in the truth of God and then get future warriors surrounding you. They need you and you need them. Now to see the third thing that the Spirit of God used, we have to go all the way back to the beginning and just take a quick snapshot and let me show you the third piece 
of this warrior's development. You heard me mention it last week, but let me go ahead and lay out in David's life how the Spirit of God used this third aspect of his life. So back up, all the way back to chapter 16. And this is right after the scene where Samuel anoints David to be the future king, but he's just a cute little kid. But real quickly, people saw a difference in David. Look at verse 18. This guy says, behold, I have seen a son of Jesse. Didn't even know his name yet. The Bethlehemite who is skillful in playing, a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a man of good presence, and the Lord is with him. None of those happened by accident. None of them. But some of us, as men of God, are waiting for the Spirit of God just to hit us. David didn't. The Spirit of God resting upon him changed his life. After he was anointed the future king by Samuel, daddy sent him back to the sheep. But when he went back to work, he worked differently. Check it out. Now, already, people are saying, this dude can play. You, you don't accidentally learn how to play an instrument. But now his ability as a musician is renowned. He's a man of valor. How? He's protecting sheep as a mighty warrior. You can go to work as a man of God with valor. A man of war? We already know the story of the sling and the story of the sword. Prudent in speech? You don't accidentally become a good speaker. You must practice at being able to articulate and put things together. He worked at it. And a man of good presence. He had good people skills. He knew how to read a room. He knew how to read a person. And then finally, and the Lord is with him. You don't accidentally align your life to the Spirit of God. You must learn to hear his still, small voice. And David worked at it. And it wasn't just this little testimony of some guy saying of a kid he did not even know his name. Son of Jesse is all he got. It showed up on the battlefield. So remember that conversation that David had with Saul? And Saul says, um, you're a cute little boy. This Goliath guy has been a warrior longer than you've been alive. And you want to take him on? Here's the part of the story I didn't tell you a few minutes ago. This is what David said to the king. Chapter 17, verse 36. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears. I told you he went to work as a man of valor and war. And this uncircumcised Philistine, remember again what that means? One who defies the living God shall be like one of them, lion or bear that I killed, for he has defied the armies of the living God. What did David say? Well, one, God will do this. We are the army of the living God. But he's also saying, I've been practicing as a man of valor, as a man of war, as a protector of my daddy's sheep. And I'm telling you what, if I can take out a lion or a bear, lions and bears, this Philistine is no challenge for me because I am a warrior of God. What's the third aspect of becoming a mighty warrior of God? Practice, what we would call a rule of life, where you engage intentionally in actions to become the man God has created you to be. Oh, man of God, are you living like that? 
Are you living like the anointing of God is on you? Are you just waiting for it to hit you? Or are you practicing stepping into your identity? You might be saying, God, you spoke over me that I am free. I sure don't feel free right now, but I'm gonna practice. What gift has the Lord given you? Maybe just in seed form, just, just, just the beginnings of. What do you know the Lord has gifted you with? Are you developing that? Are you working at it? Are you practicing it? It doesn't just hit you. The Spirit of God gives you the opportunity to create a rule of life whereby you develop that. Oh, men of God, stop trying to be mighty and begin training to be mighty. Men of God. You're like, Michael, I don't even know where to start. I'm guessing that there is a man of God somewhere in your life Hopefully it's your father. And if not, be looking around. Who is a mighty man of God who can currently do what you cannot currently do? Ask that man of God. Hey, that one thing you do that I can't do, would you help me learn how to do that? Oh, men of God, rise up. Oh, men of God, take the steps in the power of the Spirit to be who he has gifted and called you to be. Oh, men of God, rise up. Let me pray for us. Oh God, thank you. Thank you for this treasure of a story that we have captured in scripture. Thank you. That for many of us, we knew uh, the names David and Goliath, but we had not seen the beautiful story, your truth, experienced by David, your truth, the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ inviting us to be who you created and have saved us to be in Christ. Oh God, Raise up mighty men of God who may today be a cute kid like David was, who may today feel overlooked, who may today be stuck, who may today be hated and hunted, and yet by your truth, mighty God, you have declared who they are. Raise up mighty men of God right here in Southern Illinois and beyond to your glory, by your grace. It is in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.